Hi everyone, this is Joseph. We are here watching this in the wee hours of the morning, seeing what the experts have to say about this issue. And I know attorneys who are overseas watching this midnight over there. There's so many good advice, all condensed into this one session. So if you have this problem, you need to go download it from Ayla Agora or Ayla University. But here are the key takeaways. Let's get to it. They start their session talking about their pre-immigration planning sessions. And you know these attorneys are some of the best because they go through this procedure. They don't just help a client get the green card and then no additional service. But after getting the green card for the client, they spend the time to really educate the client on how to maintain this green card. How do you plan to establish routes here? Because a lot of people have the misconception that a green card is just a glorified tourist visa. Now you don't have to go to the consulate anymore. You don't have to buy a ticket. You can just use your green card and go in and out of the country but that's not the case. And here's the key question. How do you prove that the U.S. is your home even if you're not here for some time? Well, your residence, tax return, bank accounts, licenses, your company. Are you serving as, as a board of a director for your company, for a nonprofit? Do you give to charity? Are you part of any conferences that you're attending? Do you Are you a speaker? Are you part of any key memberships? Do you win any awards? All of these things help establish the ties that you have here in order to prove that you did not abandon your residency. And that goes to their second point. The second point is how long is too long? So if you've been out of the US for six months to a year, well, you might have a problem. If you've been outside of the US for over one year, but you have a re-entry permit, you might have a problem. But if you don't have a re-entry permit, then you may have a bigger problem. If you've been outside for over two years with a re-entry permit, it's a big problem. If you've been outside for over two years without a re-entry permit, you have a big problem. So that begs the question, what is a re-entry permit? Well, it's exactly what the name says. It allows you to come back in even though you've been out of the country. And that tells you something, right? As a green card holder, if you need to leave the US for some time, you need to apply for a re-entry permit so you can get back in. That shows you that you cannot just easily leave the US even if you are a green card holder. And re-entry permits are notoriously difficult to apply for because the lengthy time it takes to get it. So let's say you need to leave the US for a year applying for it, you might not be able to get it until six months later. Just think about that, right? You might have an urgent reason to travel for a long time. Maybe your father is about to pass away and this is his last six months and you need to leave and to spend the six months with him. You quit your job and you leave. Well, it might take six months to get that re-entry permit before you could come back. And during the pandemic, of course, a lot of people left thinking they'll come back within a short month, two months, but for all of the reasons that is happening in the world, they can't come back for over a year. They didn't get the re-entry permit and now they're stuck. So the first thing that the panelists really urge is get the re-entry permit. And they talked about exactly how to get it. It's a wonderful podcast. You totally need to download it from Ayla Agora. Now, it's not impossible to get the re-entry permit expedited. There's a lot of phone calls you need to make. There's a lot of documents you need to prepare. There's a lot of people you need to beg. But as attorneys, that's what we do. We are, in a sense, professional beggars. We tell the officers, dear kind officer, please understand the special circumstances surrounding our client's case. May you use your discretionary power and grant in favor of our client this particular matter and expedite the process. So normally, it would take, I know, two, three months to get the biometrics fingerprinting done, but please ex allow this particular exception just this one time so that our client can get it within a few days because they need to leave. The plane ticket is already purchased. The father is about to pass away. Use your discretionary power. Make America great. This is what America is all about. So the client files the re-entry permit. We beg the officer to allow for this expedited processing. They grant the biometrics within a few days. The client is able to go get their biometrics done, fly out of the country, and then the re-entry permit gets mailed to their house or our office or any law office and then we take it and FedEx it over and now the client can be at peace, have the green card in hand, have the re-entry permit in hand and hopefully return within the time frame of the re-entry permit. Some re-entry permits are only valid for one year. Think about that, right? You need to urgently leave the country for a, a long duration and for an urgent reason, it takes six months before you could get the re-entry permit, and then it's only a valid for one year. Now, luckily, a lot of re-entry permits are valid for two years. Now that the client is outside of the country, with or without a re-entry permit, then time has elapsed. 
how do they get back to the US? The panelists talk about there's two options. One way to do it is to go to the consulate and get an SB1 visa. They talk about all the intricacies and what you have to do in order to get that done. They mentioned that it is extremely difficult. So from what they have seen, cases have been denied at the consulate level regarding this, and it's much more difficult to prove. And one of the things that they say that is really interesting is you can't just say, because of the pandemic, I couldn't leave. Now, I knew that that's the case with the CBP officers here in the US. They explicitly said last year, we're no longer going to accept pandemic as a reason because green card holders are permitted to come back to the US. There's no travel ban against them. So why didn't you come back? Even people with visas urgent that needed urgently travel, they came back. So how about you, green card holder? So um, if, you, if the pandemic is no longer a reason that's valid, CBP. But I didn't know that the consulates would require additional specific reason, even though they are there in that country adjudicating those cases. So um, the panelists were sharing examples and stories that when they went to the consulate to apply for the sb ones visa, they had to specifically talk about the country's condition and their family's condition and why they couldn't go back. And, and maybe there's a uh, travel ban, and there's a lack of uh, airlines available for that country, they couldn't fly out, all sorts of specific reason to them. And then they can get the sb one visa. But the panelists were we're saying that it's extremely difficult to get. They also mentioned there's two additional risks with applying for the SB1 visa at the consulate. The first being, even if your SB1 visa gets denied, they might confiscate your green card. And that is very worrisome because I know that that is illegal, right? Nowadays, all the consulates have stopped canceling people's green cards, forcing people to file for 407. It, it should just be, the procedure on FAM should just be um, we cancel your visa, you need to apply again later on, but they don't actually take your green card. Now, I have seen consulate officers do administrative processing and hold on to the passport and the green card and not return it for many, many months. One of the clients that I, I've seen held on to their documents for over two years now. And so they didn't cancel it per se, but holding on to it for a long time is almost as good as canceling it because there is an expiration on all of these things, right? So that is a particular danger that you can. The second danger is that the consular officer, once they deny the SB1, they put it in their system. If later on the permanent resident try to fly to the US, the CBP officer at the airport will see that and might take that into consideration. Even though they're completely different agencies under different bodies of the government, they could stay, take that into account, right? Well, if I let them in and another agency denied them, that might look bad on me. So maybe I shouldn't let them in. So that's the risk that you face. And that's what the panelists were cautioning. Now let's go to the second option. If you don't apply for an SB1 visa, then what should you do? The officers talk about chanting it with the CPP officers, meaning you just take your green card, you buy a ticket, you might get canceled, you might be forced to buy a plane ticket and get returned and all these things, but you chance it. You take the gamble and you directly fly to the US and face the officer. And that is a gamble that we've seen a lot of people do over this past year. They prepare their documents in hopes to explain everything to the CBP officer at the airport. Now, this second option is not without its own risks. If you present your documents to a CBP officer at the airport, they can drag you in to a secondary review document and cancel your green card, right? So technically, when you're doing an SB1 visa, they cannot take your green card. But at the CBP, they can. And so now you face that risk. The law technically puts the burden on you to prove that you did not abandon your green card because you've been outside of the US for too long. With one agency, they cannot confiscate. With another, they can. But what should you do? And also, at the airport or at this board of entry, port of entry, you do not have legal representation, right? CBP officer, you don't have the right to have an attorney present. You are in international territory. You don't have that right. So the panelist, with all of their wisdom, advised with this tactic, tell the CBP officer, look, I understand I might not have enough documents to persuade you that the US is my home. Can I go to deferred inspection, please? What is deferred inspection? Well, when you're flying into the US, you are being inspected, right? And if proven 
that you have abandoned your green card, then they confiscate your green card and they force you to fly back or enter as a tourist. But that already gave up the game. So if you request for deferred inspection, what that means is, okay, well, I'm not inspecting you right now. Technically, you have not officially entered the US. I will let you in. I will hold on to your green card and your passport. And a week later or two weeks later, you come back at a deferred time, deferred inspection, and now prove your case. Prove that the US is your home. But what is good about this, right? What is the genius thing about this? Well, once you enter the US and then you go to deferred inspection, now attorney can be present and represent you at defer deferred inspection. And you also have an extra week or two weeks to prepare all your documents to prove your case, right? So that's the genius thing about deferred inspection. It gives you more time. We know you've traveled already 10 hours, 14 hours, some because of transfer flights. You've been traveling for three days. You're exhausted. You're not at the best point to explain why you've left and why the US is your home and all of the reasons above. Maybe it's midnight and the officer is tired as well. You don't wanna be in a situation with two tired people trying to argue. It's just good marital advice also, right? You don't want to discuss anything that is complicated that might lead into a fight after 9 p.m. You just know that, that should be a firm family policy. Do not discuss anything after 9 p.m. Same thing with the CBP entries. If you are flying in after 9 p.m., everybody's tired, can I have a deferred inspection, please? Let's, let's, let's postpone this discussion. And that is totally permissible. The next big thing is the I-193 waiver. Now, what is that? It's a waiver for a travel document to enter the US. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this because people think, oh, if all I have to do is just pay for a filing fee and file the I-193, and then I will be permitted the US. The US just wants money. That is not the case, okay? A lot of people think, all I have to do is file this form first, pay a fee, then I will be permitted to come back to the US. It's a very transactional thing. That is not true. You cannot file this before you enter the US. So you need to fly to the US, see the CBP officer, present your case, and if the CBP officer believes you and you lack the reentry permit that's required to be outside of the country, then they may permit you to file this form and pay the fee. It's an honor, it's a privilege, it's a success if the officer tells you to file this form, okay? So you cannot just pay for it and tell the officer, look, I paid for it, here's my receipt, let me in. You can't do that. That's, it, 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 they give you that privilege. So the idea is you've been outside for over a year. Technically, you should have applied for a reentry permit, but you didn't because of the pandemic and all sorts of reasons. I understand, okay, here, here's the form, make this payment. Basically, it's the filing fee for the reentry permit. So instead of having a reentry permit, now I'm making you pay for it now. That's it, that's, that's, that's the idea. Okay, now we get to talk about boarding foils. That's the new big thing. It's the I-131A. It's different than the reentry permit. Although in many languages, the reentry permit and the boarding foil, it's the same name, it's super confusing, and it's I-131 and versus I-131A, we need better names. But the idea is you lost your green card overseas and you need to get a document to show the airlines, to show the officer that you're permitted to board so you can get a boarding foil. That is relatively new um, in the world of immigration that hasn't been around for a long time. You pay for it in the US and then you make an appointment with a consulate abroad and then you go present your case and then the consulate gives you a boarding foil so that you could take it to board the plane. And um, after the interview, typically, the boarding foils are only valid for 30 days, so you need to board the plane and fly to the US. Now, the trick is you need to pay for it within a year, but the scheduling of the appointment with the consulates doesn't have to happen immediately. We've seen a lot of boarding foils where you pay for it right just at the year mark, and then you don't schedule, uh, the clients don't schedule the appointment until three months, four months later, and then after scheduling it, 
actually, after scheduling it, if the, the schedule was too quick, they postponed the appointment. And then after the appointment, they have another 30 days and then they fly to the US. What that means is a lot of people have used the boarding foil instead of a re-entry permit and instead of paying for the waiver, the, uh, the I-193 waiver. Now, what is important to know is that the boarding foil is not a replacement for the re-entry permit because it's used for completely different purposes. The boarding foil allows you to get on the plane. You don't have a green card to show that you can enter the US, so you show the boarding foil. But just because the plane allows you to get on and fly to the US doesn't mean the CBP officers would accept that boarding foil and let you in. You still need to prove that you have not abandoned your residence. And if you didn't apply for a re-entry permit, they might force you to pay for the waiver, which will be an honor, honestly. So just pay for it, come in, and now your green card is safe. And that's it for this episode. But the panelists did talk a lot about other things as well, like very important things like how to get your citizenship, even though you're not in the US, the Form 470, and etc. Now, if you're interested in that, please go ahead and download it from Ayla Agora or watch it at Ayla University or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, hopefully, it will. all of these will become podcasts eventually. That will be so useful. But that's it for this first session. Let's jump to the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.